Okay, thank you very much. Um, so as Sergio said, uh, today I'll be talking about the core of my research, which is on light payload seismic isolation, which I'll get to exactly what I mean by that in a few slides. Uh, but here looking at passive solutions. Uh, just a little bit of background. So if we look at the resilience of a community, uh, infrastructure network, something like that, uh, you'll see these uh, lost triangles a lot of times where your facility, okay, your facility has some functionality that it's maintaining. A disaster occurs, you lose functionality, uh, and then you'll recover back to that original system functionality. Uh, with aging infrastructure, uh, the systems are more vulnerable, so you're going to have a greater loss initially. Uh, we can come in and we can uh, try to mitigate those initial losses, but then also there's an effect of trying to increase the rate at which we recover from the disaster. Uh, risks from earthquakes, and this is for any natural hazard really, injuries and fatalities are sort of paramount. Uh, economic losses, uh, needing to repair or replace buildings, bridges, uh, are also important. But then here, most of my work is focused on indirect economic losses. So looking at business interruption uh, and loss of services. So for example, the, the systems that Diego was talking about, those rely on the internet. They rely on connectivity. They rely on valuable and sensitive equipment housed within buildings. Uh, so here, if we talk about essential facilities, uh, these need to maintain life safety is, is paramount, uh, but op also operational under a rare earthquake. Uh, so here, sort of, I'm thinking about this block right here. Okay, and so we can talk about police and fire stations, uh, hospitals, and emergency communication centers. They need to maintain operation because these are essential in the recovery process. So we're not going to be able to recover if we don't have communication. And so this is mission critical equipment. Uh, so if we think about hard drives at a data center, that's going to be crunching all these numbers to determine which bridges, which buildings need to be inspected. We need to make sure that these data centers are still functional during and after the earthquake. Uh, likewise, with uh, hospitals, there's been a lot of studies uh, looking at medical equipment, right? We're going to have to triage patients, so we need to have access to that equipment. Um, otherwise, we won't be able to treat patients. Uh, and then other sorts of slender objects. Uh, and here, even thinking about statues, right? So priceless artifacts uh, that may not be important in the recovery process, but cultural heritage-wise, they're very important. Okay, so the, the problem here is that these sensitive equipment are susceptible to harsh, harsh floor motions. So by bolting, here I'm, I'm gonna be talking about a cabinet. Uh, the floor motions are gonna go into the cabinet and just like a building with an earthquake, the equipment's gonna be shaken, potentially damaged. Uh, so y'all watch some videos on base isolation. Basic idea is we want to create some compliant interface, uh, some mechanism that diminishes the load path between the floor and the equipment. Uh, and this is base isolation. At this scale, it's exactly the same as at the building scale. Uh, we want to detune the equipment, so stretching out the period of uh, the isolated equipment away from the disturbance, uh, trying to reduce accelerations to sensitive equipment, so a lot of hard drives are rated for accelerations, uh, 0.3 G, so not terribly high. Uh, and then in, in turn, this will eliminate some of the business interruption. Uh, so making sure that our systems are maintaining functionality during and after. The types of systems that I mainly focus on are rolling type seismic isolation systems. So in the videos that y'all watched, uh, there's lead rubber bearings. Uh, there's a little bit of talk about friction pendulum bearings. These are more similar to those. So this is a mechanism instead of sliding, there's rolling action. This is especially good for light payloads because you can get very low damping. Uh, you actually have run into issues with very light pieces of equipment where you can't even overcome the friction so you're not actually isolated at all. So the basic idea is you have a top platform, a bottom platform, a ball that's between these and so these dishes are concaved just like the friction pendulum systems uh, and then you have some equipment uh, that rests on top of these. 
So sort of in the spectrum of seismic isolation, uh, here I'm really talking about light payloads. So single cabinets or groups of cabinets. If we go to moderate, uh, now we're talking about isolating potentially a whole floor within the bay of a building or even residential. Uh, so timber construction, this was a project uh, by Greg Deerline uh, where they're trying to have a modular home that the entire thing is isolated. And then we can go to very large scales, uh, isolating bridges or isolating larger structures. So what I want to talk about today is just some of the testing that we did. Uh, this is actually testing that I collaborated with Wei Song, who's at the University of Alabama. He went to these preemptive savvy workshops. He and I met uh, in Japan, and this collaboration came out of that. Uh, so here we're doing some testing for a company uh, where they're trying to test these isolation bearings. Uh, the system here, this is a network cabinet. Um, there, there's some details there. I don't want to dwell on it. Uh, but just note, these are big masses, so they loaded it down as if it was uh, really in use. It really had hard drives in it. In turn, this created an eccentricity, so our mass was not concentric uh, with the center of stiffness, which is going to induce some torsional effects. The bearings that we're looking at have a displacement capacity of about 18 centimeters. They're conical so that you get a peak uh, acceleration of the slope. So in theory, the largest acceleration you would ever sustain is a tenth of a G, um, but we'll see that that isn't quite so true in practice. And then we're going to look at two different rolling uh, surface treatments, one that's bare steel and one that has some elastomeric damping liner. Inherently, with the, the bare steel, it's very lightly damped, which is great for isolation, but not so great for suppressing displacements. OK, and so uh, here, this is the shake table at Alabama. Um, yeah, sorry. Sorry, Justin. <laughs> Not, not that I condone Roll Tide, but uh, so, so this, this is a single axis table that we were testing on. Uh, we're using a, a, an array of string potentiometers, accelerometers to measure responses uh, of these cabinets. And some of the parametric variation that we we're looking at was the number of cabinets. So the, the typical sort of testing configuration for qualification purposes would be using a single cabinet. But as I showed in the original slides, a lot of times these are sort of chained out and you'll have 10 cabinets strung out on a single system. Uh, so we wanted to look at that. Unfortunately, we only went up to two. Uh, I guess two is bigger than one, but uh, we're, we'll get there eventually. Uh, so looking at how the number of cabinets affected it, also the orientation, whether we're testing it side to side, so the table's moving in this direction versus front to back, so now the table's moving in this direction is front to back. In the side to side, we have an eccentricity in our mass, so we expect to see larger rotations. And then again, the rolling surfaces, there's a bare steel, and then this is an elastomeric liner. Uh, think about a, a rhino liner for your truck bed. It's pretty much that. And again, we, we were doing these tests really for qualification uh, for, these, for these systems, but uh, we, we did a whole battery of tests. Uh, so the ground motion that we're using is the Vertec 2 record, uh, which is a relatively strong ground motion. Uh, not so important. Okay, so just some of the experimental results. This doesn't show up great. Uh, so here, just some of the longitudinal displacement, longitudinal acceleration and rotations for the side-to-side -side orientation. We have peak displacements of about 18, which is less than our uh, capacity, and what we'll know is we have rotations on the order of five to eight degrees. So because we have that eccentricity, we're inducing a lot of rotations. Compare that to the front to back orientation. In this case, our rotations, we still develop sun, so these systems are actually chaotic. Uh, so even if you load it in one direction, you actually start to develop motion uh, in other directions just due to slight imperfections in the system. Um, but what we'll note here is that our displacements get very large, so we're actually at the capacity of these systems, and correspondingly, there's these large spikes and accelerations, so this pounding sort of effect um, within the bearings. Okay, and so the gang system, very similar results, uh, so I don't want to dwell on it so much, but again, we see some impacting, some spikes in our acceleration. So some of the takeaways or the observations uh, from these tests 
is that the rotational coupling cannot be ignored. So we saw that we had some rotations which actually sometimes led to premature impacts. Uh, also, even this is a DBE level event, um, we are still seeing impacts. So we need to in some way increase damping. Okay, so let's see here. So this is just a video of the tests or of one of the tests. So this is in the side to side orientation. So you can see the tables moving underneath of it and we're getting very good isolation where essentially the cabinet is standing uh, still, uh, just like sort of you, you saw in the videos and ways in the control room. Okay, and so in that, you could see a little bit of whipping action, so it tended to rotate about its uh, center of stiffness and center of gravity. So now when we added the damper liner, what we note is our displacements went down significantly. No longer do we see impacts in these systems. Uh, so, right, increased damping, decreased displacements, ultimately improve the performance. Uh, so, so we saw with that rubber liner that we had some improved performance. Uh, another part of this work was, again, these systems are highly chaotic. We need to have a model to predict these responses. So we've done a lot of work on modeling them. Uh, so here's just a, a setup where we have multiple con uh, cabinets potentially. Um, this is my equation slide. <laughs> I think there's another one after this. Okay, so we're, we're using an energy-based approach, so expressing kinetic and potential energy. Uh, the one that I really want to highlight here is the condition of rolling without slipping. So here the balls roll between these non-parallel surfaces, uh, and this actually constitutes a non-holonomic constraint, which just tells you that the ball at any given time, I can't tell you where it is, I have to actually track where it came from. Um, so it's not just half the displacement, it depends on the path that I took to get there. Okay, and so we, we found the equations of motion, and at the end of the day, it looks a whole lot like what we're used to. We have some inertia, some damping, some restoring forces, and some excitation. So it, look, it looks a whole lot like what we're used to. Uh, so just to validate the model, we, we ran the simulations, uh, and we see very good correspondences in terms of our displacements. Uh, in both cases, here we're actually predicting an impact uh, it doesn't quite occur at the same time, but we're still predicting the occurrence of impacts because the system is chaotic. If I do a slight perturbation at the very beginning, the response is drastically different. Uh, so paths diverge with slight perturbations. Uh, so without the exact right configuration, we'll never exactly predict, predict the trajectories. Uh, for the gang cabinet, very, very similar results. Uh, so we're able to, uh, predict the occurrence of impacts like we'd like. For the last numerical liner, this is still a work in progress. Um, so the bare steel, we can get away with the viscous damping model. Um, rolling resistance with rubber is not as nice. Uh, so these are viscoelastic materials. Um, so, so we are currently working on trying to validate models uh, for the rolling resistance. Okay, and so that was work that, again, sort of came out of, of these workshops. Uh, and, and now I just wanna talk about some ongoing and future work on the same topic. Uh, so sort of the, the fields that we're moving into is looking at high performance solutions, focusing on these rolling type systems, isolation under rare events. Uh, so I think we're pretty good under DVE level events, but again, for an MCE level event, we need to make sure that all of our systems are functional uh, which currently our displacement capacities aren't sufficient. And then finally, uh, looking at the primary system, so the building structure that's housing this equipment and the isolation system itself, how are they interacting and can we actually engineer them to have synergistic inter interactions? So supplemental damping is a really good way of trying to improve the performance. Uh, we've also looked at just trying to stack two systems on top of each other, so we're effectively increasing the capacity. Uh, this, we're trying to re reduce the demand. This, we're trying to increase the capacity. Um, they each have drawbacks and benefits. Uh, damping is nice, it reduces our displacements at the expense of increasing accelerations. Uh, here with this system, we have effectively twice the capacity uh, with 
right? Just twice as many bearings. Um, however, experimentally, we weren't able to realize that full capacity. Uh, we've induced, right, so essentially two modes within the isolation system, uh, and it turns out that second mode is a bit of a problem. Okay, and so here, if we look at under rare events, again, we need to maintain functionality. So this is a test. This is actually from a GoPro camera we had attached to the table. Uh, so this is going to be moving with the table, and then the equipment's going to be appear to be moving relative to the table. So this is MCE level, so 50% higher than the last test. Everything seems to be going well, and you could see maybe a ball just got ejected. At this point, we're not isolating um, <laughs> at all. Uh, ooh, yeah. And this is the point where we're going like this to weigh, and he didn't get the hint. Um, so yeah, we wanted to stop the test a little bit earlier than that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, let me try to go back. So again, here you can sort of see a ball scoot out there, rolling out. So right, what's happening is we've reached the capacity. The ball hits the edge. So there is a bit of a lip there. And then it just rolls over. So there's nothing restricting us from losing the ball. Um, so this is, this is a sort of event that we want to now design for or we're thinking about. Uh, so the approach that we've been taking is trying to come up what is the optimal uh, sort of restoring action out there at those edges. Uh, so we're using an optimal control approach to actually design trajectories, which we can then use to guide the design of a passive device. So open loop control cannot be implemented in real time, but it still is the best possible control action, restoring force action that we could achieve, um, where we're subjected to the dynamics of the system and passivity constraints, right? So at the end of the day, we can't be injecting energy. We don't want to have an active controller. We want this to be passive, uh, so it's easy to, easier to implement. This will serve as a benchmark to the design the guide of some impact mechanism, so actually trying to engineer impacts uh, to, to meet certain goals. Okay, and lastly, looking at primary, secondary system interactions, uh, so now, moving up in scales a little bit, thinking about isolating an entire floor within a building, uh, we're going to be now talking about higher mass ratios. So when you go and you design the primary structure, or if you go and design the isolation system, you sort of treat them as independent. Okay, I use the floor motions coming from the building, but there's no sort of two-way interaction. There's no communication between the isolated mass and the building. Uh, and so this diagram is sort of trying to show that. So depending on the frequency ratio and the mass ratio, uh, we need to incorporate uh, that interaction. So now what we're actually trying to do, again, is engineer impacts. So it's at those points of impact that we get really strong coupling between the isolation system and the primary structure. So the questions that we're trying to answer are, will these impacts induce coupling? Um, can I still believe this, this is based on linear theory, and I'm very much outside of linear theory at this point, do these assumptions still hold? Uh, but the more important question that we're trying to address is, can we actually engineer these impacts to be beneficial uh, to both the structure and the isolation system? So thinking about sort of a dual mode of operation where under low level hazards, our main focus is uninterrupted operation of the isolated equipment, so we want to reduce what's being felt by that equipment within the building. But then as we move up to MCE and higher level earthquakes, what we really don't want to have happen is the building fall down. Building falls down, doesn't matter how well your isolation system is working. Uh, so thinking of it as almost like a sacrificial unit, um, as a nonlinear energy sink or like a TMD, which again, you all saw a video on that. Uh, very much nonlinear, though, so not, not your Den Hartog absorber. OK, so just to, to wrap things up, uh, seismic isolation is an attractive solution to reduce downtime and business interruption, uh, so these sort of essential services that are key to the recovery process, uh, and ultimately enhancing a community's resilience. If we're faced with aging infrastructure, um, this is an easy retrofit to ensure that at least the the uh, contents of the building are being protected. Um, we've, we've done a lot of modeling of these systems, engineering of these systems, and we have a few sort of 
uh, goals going forward about high, for, high performance solutions uh, for very extreme earthquakes. Okay, and so with that, uh, yeah, this was work funded by NSF. Uh, WorkSafe Technologies was the manufacturer. Um, Alabama, as much as I don't want to put that there, and uh, thank you. <laughs>